1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. A tremendous Monday to each and every one of you. Thanks and welcome to the second week of Advent here in 2022. Father John Trujillo is in the house, in the starting blocks, ready to go, ready to answer your questions. So if you'd like to be part of the program, the number is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, that number is one 205 and we'll even put you straight to the front of the line at 1-205-271-2985. You can always send us an email. That email address is openline at EWTN.com. I'm Jack Williams. Charles Beery is our celebrity producer today. Your call screener is Matt Kubensky and Jeff Burson handling our social media efforts. So if you're watching us, on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can type a question into the chat window, and it may find its way to us by the end of the program. And our host, the aforementioned Father John Tregilio, how are you? I'm doing well. I hope you noticed my purple pocket can uh, hanky. Well, there you go. Your, your camera's up a little bit too high to pick it up, but when you just showed it to us, we were able to see it. So <laughs> okay. Very, very penitential and very uh, 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 um, calendar appropriate of you. <laughs> I've got a, uh, speaking of sin, um, <laughs> Albert writes in, can a person be fully healed from sin by God, and does one need confession still if this happens? Well, a, uh, a baptized Catholic, uh, especially since after they receive their baptism, First Holy Communion and First Confession, uh, needs to go to the sacrament to be forgiven of all mortal sins since the last valid confession. Uh, Non-Catholics, obviously, um, they need to make a perfect act of contrition to be truly sorry in their depth of their heart, but the advantage of, of the Catholic sacrament of penance, reconciliation, is that you hear the words, I absolve you from your sins, so you have moral certainty, and also you get the grace of the sacrament, which is sanctifying grace. So, for again, for a Catholic or for a Eastern Orthodox, uh, they need to avail themselves of the sacrament, particularly for mortal sins. Venial sins can be forgiven through any of the sacramentals uh, just by praying and asking for God's forgiveness. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Still a couple of open phone lines for you at 833-288-3986. Henry wants to know, why would I need to do works to be saved if Jesus died for me and I believe in him? Well, uh, the point is that we need to use our faith, put it into practice. And this is from St. James, which is in the Bible uh, itself. It's an inspired text, and it's in the Bible. It's in the New Testament. And St. James makes it very clear that faith without works is empty. It's shallow. It's not that it's in competition. It's not, that, is it faith or is it uh, works? It's both of them which are motivated and empowered by divine grace. And if we didn't need to do any good works, then what's the whole purpose of Jesus telling us, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you clothed me, and so forth. All the uh, works of mercy, especially the corporal works of mercy, uh, those are works. And, you know, our Lord himself uh, commanded us to do that, to, you know, go the extra mile to give our our shirt and our coat as well. So works are necessary, but they're not something that's exclusive of faith, and certainly they, they need grace. St. Paul talked as much about fearing losing his salvation than he did about his salvation itself, huh? That's right. And, you know, if anyone showed us that he did good works, it was St. Paul. I mean, all his missionary journeys, uh, all the things he did, uh, these are things that are, it's not... Faith alone, sola fide, which, by the way, is, is not in Scripture, uh, but it's faith with works. Again, 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number. It's a free phone call anywhere in North America, 833-288-3986. And, Father, 
this uh, this next question, the the way that it's framed, uh-huh. makes me sad for our culture that it has to be that it has to be framed oh. this way. But Alyssa asks, is a baby born into original sin when they are born to married parents? Wow. Uh, yes, every human being uh, is born with original sin, and the context of the status of the parents uh, has no bearing on the spiritual state of the child. So, therefore, you know, we don't even use that terminology anymore, uh, an illegitimate child, because that's a legal thing which involves the state uh, in the eyes of the church. You know, a human being is a child of God. And we all, except for the fact that by the virtue of the grace of the Immaculate Conception uh, with the Virgin Mary and obviously Jesus himself, who is the Son of God, every other human being is born um, with original sin. Now, St. John the Baptist was conceived with original sin, but we believe he was uh, sanctified in the, his womb of his mother when uh, Mary came to visit Elizabeth and John leapt in her womb. But other than that, you know, a baby born of married parents or non-married parents, the original sin has no, it's not contextualized by the parents, is the fact that it's human nature. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Mike writes in, when family or friends have a baby out of wedlock, it seems proper to me to still say congratulations. What do you think? Oh, I, I mean, definitely you don't want to penalize the child. The, the child has no um, act in which you know, he or she had anything to do with you know, how the marital status of their parents. And it, it is something that you want to you know, be careful about, too, because we don't want to give credence and condoning um, people having children out of wedlock, but at the same token, we don't want to show any disdain for the child. So I would say, yes, you want to congratulate. Yes, you want to share in their joy. But also, you, you know, you want to encourage them uh, to, you know, rectify the situation by getting married. Now, even the church will not obligate uh, an unmarried couple to get married in order for them to baptize their child because that could be uh, grounds for an annulment if you're forcing them. But Certainly the priest, the deacon, lay, lay people can encourage, can suggest that it'd be better for the child if mom and dad intend to stay together for the rest of their life, that they do marry, uh, receive the grace of the sacrament. And that way, too, as the child's growing up and the child's making his or her first communion, so can m- mom and dad can go, go to communion, which they would not be able to do if they're living in sin. Um, Joan writes in, she says, Father, since you teach at a seminary, you're the best person to ask about an aspect of reconciliation. How are seminarians taught to relate to penitents? Are they being taught to be gentle, kind, and compassionate confessors as the prodigal son? When they have practice or mock confessions, are they critiqued if they come across as harsh or unsympathetic? Yes. (laughs) <laughs> That's the easy answer. In fact, uh, I'm going to be doing what we call penance practicum after Christmas with some of my colleagues here at the seminary where we pretend to be a penitent and we grade them, we advise them, we counsel them on their pastoral technique that you know they are not to be uh, mean or nasty or impatient uh, with the penitent because the penitent offended God, not me, the priest. Uh, also, you know, that they give good counsel, they give good uh, advice, uh, proper penances. Um, we want them to be precise. Uh, and, and I remember, yes, once or once or twice when I was a kid, we had a grumpy old curmudgeon in the, in the confessional. And, you know, we say to the guys, you never want to be that priest. And I think they understand that because, one, they, most of them have never had that experience. And, two, even if they did, they realize that this is a sacrament of mercy, and we want people to come back. We don't want to scare them away. You know, if you ever need someone who's not pretending to be a penitent, just give me a call. And I'd be happy to... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll fly you in. <laughs> I have to imitate the pen. I get into my part, you know, when I'm like a little uh, Hispanic girl who's 12 years old, I-, I get into my part when I'm playing this. You know, and it's, and it's interesting because these are things that if you're not intimately involved with the seminary, you don't think much about. And I remember... Uh, friend of mine, Father Chris Decker, gave us a tour of, of Notre Dame Seminary in New Orleans, which has really uh, transformed itself in recent years. And it was just interesting. It makes perfect sense, but it was interesting to see a lab 
for lack of a better term, for for priests to practice the mechanics of saying the Mass. Oh, exactly. In fact, we just did that the other day. We are practicing with them. They, they put on their vestments. Uh, we, we, we judge them on their gestures, uh, their their volume, their tone, uh, rubrics, everything. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. It's a free phone call anywhere in North America. A couple of open lines for you at 833-288-3986. It's Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio. Most original Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. Next time on EWTN Live, Dr. Joseph Holcraft shares how the High Calling Program helps Sumerians and potential priests pursue their vocation. EWTN Live with me, Father Mitch Patrol, Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern on EWTN TV and Radio. If you struggle with ways to help your young and growing family stay faithful, you're not alone. In The Prayer Book for Tired Parents, Practical Ways to Grow in Love of God and Get Your Family to Heaven, David and Debbie Cowden share practical ideas and resources to help your family live out the faith in everyday life. Packed with traditional prayers, popular devotions, and reflections on some tremendous saints, this book will also help your family develop positive prayer habits, reignite your love of your Catholic faith, and pursue a deeper relationship with God. The Prayer Book for Tired Parents, Practical Ways to Grow in Love of God and Get Your Family to Heaven by David and Debbie Cowden. The latest release from EWTN Publishing, now available at EWTNRC.com or call 1-800-854-6316. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, Call 1-205-271-2985 or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. You know, we've got a great little guide for you during this Advent season. Father Joseph's Advent and Christmas Reflections and free ebook to help you bring closer to help bring you rather closer to the infant Jesus and his blessed mother in the days leading up to the celebration of the nativity we'd like to invite you to sign up and receive weekly emails with father joseph's advent and christmas reflections in, in addition we'd like to send you a beautiful free ebook that includes all of those reflect, reflections just visit ewtn.com/advent today 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Still two lines open for you at 833-288-3986. Jonathan is first up today in the great state of Wisconsin, listening on WSFI Radio. Jonathan, you are on with Father John Tregilio. Hi. Hi, Jonathan. Go right uh, ahead. Um, I had a question. Um so in the Gospels, Jesus says that whoever eats his body and drinks his blood shall inherit eternal life. Um, and this makes it seem that any Catholic who's had the Eucharist, it's an impossible impossibility for them to go to hell. But I'm confused how this is reconciled with the fact that if you are a Catholic and had the Eucharist, if you turn away from the faith and reject Jesus without repenting, you can go to hell. Okay, well, th that is a good question. Uh, the fact that we have the access to eternal life, it's not a done deal that we absolutely positively will keep it throughout our lifetime. In the same way, you know, a person who's baptized, uh, the very moment they're baptized, they're filled with sanctifying grace, all original sins washed away. And if, hypothetically, they were to die at that very moment, you know, we believe they would go uh, to heaven. But uh, receiving the precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ that we receive in Holy Communion, it gives us an increase of sanctifying grace, and we have the potential for eternal life. But where we're going to spend eternity, in heaven or hell, 
is contingent upon the the life that we live. So uh, a Catholic cannot just presume, because that would be the sin of presumption, that their sins would automatically be forgiven without repentance, or that they just it's a done deal, that they're going to heaven no matter what. We do not believe in uh, universalism that contends that everybody is de facto going to heaven, no one's going to hell, well then you know, there's no reason for us to take up our cross or to follow Jesus, but that's not what we believe. So yes, a Catholic uh, must receive the body and blood of Christ, uh, but also must go to confession regularly and must live a good, holy, and virtuous life. Thanks so much, Jonathan. We appreciate the question today. The number is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Next up is Tom in Twinsburg, Ohio. Listening on The Rock, Tom, you're on with Father Tregilio. Hello, Father. Um, I've come across, well, several websites, but one in particular, but a document using pri- many private revelations, including to canonize saints, coupled with Matthew 7, 13 to 14, that many hundreds or thousands of people go to hell for each person who goes to heaven which means I ain't got a prayer knowing myself. So that rather bothers me. Um, yes, well, uh, first of all, private revelations, even that w- those that come from saints, uh, are not something we must believe in. It's called private revelation for a reason. Public revelation, which is sacred scripture and sacred tradition, come to us uh, from the Holy Spirit, divinely revealed. Private revelation, while it may be true or it may not, uh, is optional. So even something that I certainly, and many, many, many people believe in, that the Blessed Mother appeared to St. Bernadette in Lourdes or to the three children of Fatima, um, it's not obligatory. It's not de fide that you must believe it, otherwise you're not a, a good Catholic. Uh, the Church gave uh, permission and sanctioned uh, these private revelations, but private revelation it doesn't trump public revelation. And so whenever we read or hear about these uh, instances where we're being told that more people go to hell than go to heaven. Again, that's not uh, church teaching from the magisterium. Um, we do not know the, the number game. And what's more important is that everyone has the potential of getting to heaven. St. Augustine talks about everyone getting sufficient grace. It becomes efficacious with those who cooperate with it. We have the universal salvific will of God that he would like to offer everyone the possibility of heaven, but we have to cooperate with that. So uh, it's something that, you know, we're not passive in, but the same token, you know, you have a good chance, as as do I and everyone else, of getting there if we do what God wants, if we follow his will. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Grab this open phone line at 833-288-3986. We head next to Syracuse, New York. Loretta is in Syracuse, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Loretta, welcome to the program. Hi, Father, and hi, Mr. William. Um, I'm a longtime listener and subscriber. I wondered, in the Old Testament, how did they determine the calendar backwards from a certain year? I mean, we went down to Jesus starting uh, on no Domine. But uh, I don't understand, when did that start? That it would say 500 B.C., and then it would go down to 400 B.C.? How did that all happen? <laughs> That's a good question, and I think I, I'm going to put that on one of my tests for the seminarians to see if they've been paying attention. Uh, we use that reference since the time of Christ. Uh, we use it as a way of, of computing the calendar, but obviously— during the time of the Egyptians, uh, the Roman Empire, uh, and so forth, they were not, they didn't use the designation B.C. before Christ because he hadn't come yet. So there was no reference point. There was no year zero, so to speak. So like in Roman Empire, they counted the calendar from the day of the founding of the city of Rome. Um, in the Jewish calendar, uh, you know, it's thousands of years uh, they would be, I think, approximately like an area in the 4,000s right now. Um, so once Christianity became the dominant force, and particularly when the Roman Empire embraced Christianity uh, during the time of Constantine and subsequent emperors, then it became standardized to say, okay, this is the year, you know, um, 313 
A.D., when the Edict of Milan took place. And going backwards, anything before the time of Christ was considered B.C., before Christ. Um, now they're using some more modern designation, common era, but that's more politically correct stuff. But again, if you read anything that's uh, from the Roman Empire, uh, their, their numbering system is not going to be based on B.C. or A.D., but from the founding of the city of Rome and likewise uh, with you know the Chinese and other uh, civilizations. So nobody would have put in like uh, Moses or anyone would have listed the year they were in as B.C. because they had no concept of that yet. Thanks, Loretta. We appreciate the call today. That frees up another line for you at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. That's the number that Anna used. She is in the great state of New Jersey watching EWTN television today. Anna, thanks for holding. You're on with Father Trujillo. Hi, Father. I want to know what the soul is. I understand the body, when you die, your body goes up to heaven and your soul, does it disintegrate? I want to know because I'm going to be cremated. Well, uh, first of all, the soul is immaterial. The soul uh, does not die. And what happens at the moment of death, the soul is separated from the body. That's why the body literally decomposes and is dead because the soul is absent. The soul is the principle of life. And as a human being, our soul has two faculties, a rational intellect and a free will. Uh, when we die, the soul is judged that we call particular judgment, and the person either goes to heaven or to hell or to purgatory and then to heaven. Uh, the body then decomposes, and whether you die or you decompose in the grave with a body or uh, you're cremated, uh, it waits for the resurrection of the dead, which happens at the end of the world when Jesus comes back in the second coming, and we have the general resurrection and the general judgment, at that point, uh, the, the two are reunited. So the soul doesn't disintegrate. There's nothing to disintegrate. It doesn't have matter uh, composed of it. The body does. And, you know, the soul is not the whole person. The whole person is body and soul. That's why the beauty of the resurrection makes sense to us. And uh, even going back to the time of um, uh, Plato and Aristotle, you know, they believed in the immortality of the soul, uh, Plato had a little bit backwards thinking that the the person was a soul entrapped in the body, but uh, Aristotle and then later with Christianity, we see that a person is both body and soul because even Jesus in his sacred humanity uh, had a body and a soul. Thank you, Anna. We appreciate the call today. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. We head next to the Republic of Texas. Beatrice is in San Antonio listening on Guadalupe Radio. Beatrice, you're on with Father John. Uh, hello, Father John. Hello, yes, Beatrice, Father go John. right ahead. Um, I, I have an, uh, I have concern, and I'm not sure if it's correct, but... I attend daily mass. Uh, I try and attend daily mass. But uh, today, I didn't go to my regular parish in Selma uh, because it was too misty. And I thought, I'm going to stop in at this other church. And um, the mass was different, was different in the fact that the priest uses a tablet, you know, one of those portable computer tablet mm -hmm. and he, he does the mass with that and um, there was no homily he read the gospel but he did not do a homily so at first I thought that maybe I my mind traveled you know was distracted and I had missed the homily and then immediately he started with the consecration but I wait when I came out, I waited for someone to come out, and I asked the individual, excuse me, but I don't know if I missed it, but did Father not give a homily? And she said he doesn't do it all the time. There's many times he doesn't do a homily. He, he just skips it. Is that proper? Uh, uh, yes, you've got some good questions there. Uh, first and foremost, 
The homily is obligatory on Sundays and holy days of obligation. On weekdays, it's optional. Now here at the seminary, we, we give a homily. The, the deacons preach a homily or the priests priest homily. When I was a pastor for 16 years um, of two parishes, I gave a little homily, or sometimes we call it a fervorino, um, but it's optional. So if the priest doesn't give a homily at the weekday mass, uh, there's nothing wrong. He's not doing anything improper. Um, but if he's got a consistent group, I mean, just a, a, a one or two minute uh, homily is, is, I think, doable. Um, whether Using a tablet, it's not encouraged, but it doesn't make it illicit or invalid. And I've used it myself at nursing homes or when traveling when it just was impractical to carry a, a full-blown Roman Missal. 833-288-EWTN. It's Open Line Monday with Father John. God might not always like to bless us with health, wealth, and prosperity, but one thing he seems to enjoy lavishing on us is opportunities for trust. He's always been that way with the people he loves. He brings us into impossible situations so he can show us that he is the Savior. He did that with Moses. I know an army is behind you, Moses. I know there's a sea in front of you. Just keep running toward it. I'm going to do something really cool. (laughs) Are you in an impossible situation right now? Is your marriage overwhelming, finances on rocky ground, boss being a jerk, friends failing you? You know, when you're at the end of your rope, you're at the beginning of God's rope. Handle your problems with prayer. We have a God who acts when we ask. And when we turn to Him with trust, we'll find that the greatest blessing He gives us in our trials is a soul that walks through life with a peace that surpasses understanding. This is Chris Stefanik from reallifecatholic.com on EWTN Radio. This is Father John Tregilio. If you missed part of today's show, catch the Encore tonight at 10 Eastern or anytime at EWTN Podcast Central. Visit us at EWTN.com slash radio slash podcast. If you have a few minutes a day, you can become an EWTN media missionary in your parish, in your community, or through prayer. Be a part of Mother Angelica's mission. Place your gifts and strengths in service to Christ and His Church by volunteering your time and sharing the eternal word with the world. Visit EWTNmissionaries.com today. EWTN, the Global Catholic Network. Hi, this is Cy Kellett, host of Catholic Answers Live. Join us today for two hours of questions and answers about the Catholic faith. Catholic Answers Live, 6 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Now back to EWTN Open Line. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Plenty of time for your calls at 833 833- 288-3986. We head next to the great state of Ohio. Mary Ann is a first-time caller listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Mary Ann, you're on with Father John Tregilio. Hi, Father. Thank you for taking my question. It's in regards, I, I'm hoping you can tell me, well, I'm sure you can tell me, um, what it means in the book of Revelation, it's uh, chapter 2, it's verse 13, At the bottom, it's the last sentence, um, to him who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone, which no one knows except him who receives it. I'm I'm curious who is saying this. Is this Jesus, and who is he saying it to, and what does it mean? Okay, you said that was Revelation uh, chapter 2? 2.13. 2.13, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, I think that if you go to the beginning of the chapter, uh, angel speaking. Um, so I don't believe that that's Jesus that's, um, saying these things, at at least my cursory reading of the beginning of the chapter two, it says an angel says to write these things. Um, you have to remember that the, the book of revelation or sometimes called the apocalypse, Uh, is what we call apocalyptic literature. And so there's a lot of allegory, metaphor in there, and it cannot be be interpreted 
uh, literally in all instances because it's not written in that way. Uh, there's a lot of figures of speech. So, you know, people get hung up on, you know, um, these uh, angels with wings and eyes and the, the whore of Babylon and the Antichrist and, you know, number 666. And we have to re read the book of Revelation certainly as inspired, infallible, inerrant uh, text but also that it's not written as a historical narrative. It's written as a, what we call apocalyptic literature, as we see also like in the book of Daniel. So a lot of these images and that have lots of possible meanings. The church has not defined most of them, uh, except when you read, uh, you know, in chapter 12, uh, the image of the woman clothed with the sun and the moon beneath her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. We've interpreted that as referring to the Virgin Mary. But some of the, I would say a good bulk of the other passages are open to a number of different interpretations. I think Scott Hahn's book on Revelation is the best uh, help to uh, reading this and interpreting it uh, faithfully. Thanks, Marianne. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Frank is in Parkersburg, West Virginia, listening to EWTN Radio today. Frank, you are on with Father John Tregilio. Uh Yes, uh, Father John. Uh, I've had quite difficulty understanding religion, even from a child. Uh, the question I had asked was, what sins do men confess to the most, and what sins do women confess to the most? And also, I, I didn't tell the screener there, but also, will we be capable of sinning in heaven? Okay, I'll start with the easy one first. Uh, no, <laughs> you, you cannot commit sin in heaven because once you're in heaven, you are in full possession of the, the supreme good and absolute truth because our our intellect seeks what is true, our will seeks what is good. And so when you're in heaven, you have the beatific vision and you cannot sin because sin is to go against uh, God's will and you're already in possession of all that. That's why even the angels were not in heaven when they were put to the test. Lucifer and the other 30 angels who went bad and became demons and were cast into hell were not technically in heaven uh, because if they were, there would be no way for them to sin. So uh, once you get in there, you're in there for good. Um, now, in terms of what <laughs> sins, I'm not allowed to say, <laughs> thankfully. Um, and I would have to, I can generally generalize in this sense. Every man and woman's capable of any sin, and um, but they're also capable of great holiness and acts of repentance. So it's not like the old days where you had your typical list of male sins, female sins, clergy sins, uh, lay sins. But you do have some sins that are connected with one state in life. Obviously, I as a priest, uh, I, I'm you know under more um, constraints in terms of my behavior and also things that I do. As a priest, and likewise, someone who's married uh, has more responsibility and obligations than someone who's not a parent, uh, more than someone who is not. But uh, there are no gender-specific uh, sins, uh, per se. So it's not, uh, the, the men don't confess being burdens to their wives, and the, <laughs> the, the women confess not bearing the burden as well as they should? <laughs> well, the, yeah, you notice we don't have a male or female a booth in yeah, the confessional. Right. <laughs> but I have to say, I, when I give retreats, I would often say and remind everybody, whether it's all men or all women, we're not here to discuss your spouse's sins, just yours. <laughs> you know, as part of a campus charismatic evangelical Christian group, and, you know, we would take over portions of apartment complexes, and we almost lived in community by a, by a Protestant, you know, sense of the word, really. And and oftentimes, you know, it was being accountable to one another was a big, uh, a big mantra of the group. And that oftentimes would sound like, you know, brother, I just wanted to uh, apologize for you being such a jerk, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like the old chapter of faults in the religious community. Yeah, that's right. That's right. God bless you, Frank. We appreciate the question today. We've got one open line for you at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 833- 288-3986. Dennis is in the great state of New York, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Dennis, thanks for holding. You're on with Father Tregilio. 
Father John, thank you for taking my call. And I, before I ask my question, I just want to say thank you for what you and all your coworkers, the call screener, and everybody does behind the scenes. I encourage people to listen to EWTN, and they get a lot out of it, and it's the way you run the show. Thank you. Now, my question is this. Uh, I was at work today, and we were watching the morning shows. They had it on the screen. And a host, I'm not going to name the network, was bragging he had a vasectomy over the weekend, and uh, all men should do so. And the studio audience all applauded to take the burden off women, that they should do all the birth control. I, you know, I was telling my two coworkers, you know, this is a mortal <laughs> sin. You yes. have a vasectomy. And uh, what can we do, Father, to get that word out more? I, I'm shocked. My two coworkers knew nothing about it. They just thought it was a nip and snip and move on. Uh, no big deal, like the co-host yeah. said. Yeah. What can we do, Father? Well, I'm glad you called, and I'm glad you asked this particular question because it isn't spoken about uh, enough and properly. Um, we want to make it clear that um, not just vasectomy, but uh, tubal ligation is also forbidden. Uh, having a woman's tubes tied or having a man have a vasectomy are considered acts of mutilation, and it's also considered uh, improper uh, contraception, sinful contraception, because the whole purpose of it is to prevent uh, birth. Now, if one uses natural family planning, you're taking advantage of the fact that uh, women are already designed to have periods where they're fertile and periods where they're infertile. And if you have sexual relations with your wife during those times when she's infertile, there's nothing sinful in involved in that. But having a vasectomy um, and having tubal ligation are both considered uh, sinful acts, and we shouldn't be bragging about it, putting it on television, or saying, well, you know, this is how the guy, um, you know, participates uh, in family planning any more than if it, with the use of the prophylactic. That's considered uh, immoral and wrong as well. Um, I would encourage uh, my colleagues, uh, priests and, and deacons, to preach about this more frequently. Obviously, you don't want to be hearing it every week, but uh, we need to do it more than just once a year. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks for the reminder today. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Um, we're heading to your neck of the woods. Father Dan is in Bethesda, Maryland, listening on Guadalupe Radio. Dan, you're on with Father John. Father John, uh, we just finished celebrating the second week of Advent in, in memory of the, the passage in Matthew where John the Baptist baptizes Christ, repent and be baptized. And it's been perplexing to me why on earth, pun intended, would God have himself baptized? Sinless per perfection have himself baptized. And uh, I've, heard, I've heard many thoughts on it, but I, I'm just curious as to what your take would be. Okay, well, I'm glad you asked, and that's a very logical question. Uh, first and foremost, as you rightly point out, uh, Jesus had no sin because he's a divine person. He's true God and true man. He has a human nature and divine nature. But he has no sin either in his humanity or his divinity. So he is not repenting of any sins that he had or could have had because he could not have had any, but because he has human nature and he represents all of humanity in his human nature. So it's just as, as he dies on the cross, the punishment that he suffers is not because he merited any punishment. He's taken upon himself all the sins of all humanity upon himself. He becomes uh, the, the victim, uh, the Lamb of God that is slain. So at the River Jordan, this is not a sacrament. Uh, this is a symbolic gesture by St. John. But Jesus allows himself to be baptized. It's a purely ceremonial, symbolic gesture because he is going to represent mankind itself because man sinned against God in the Garden of Eden and the God-man, Jesus Christ, is going to reconcile uh, both heaven and earth, both God and man, in himself. Is there anything to the notion that he was also sanctifying all of the waters of baptism to come? Yes, his very act of being baptized, therefore, elevates it to the level of a sacrament, because then he says later in the gospel, 
go and baptize all the nations in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. John did not invoke the Holy Trinity. John's baptism was, was purely symbolic. But Jesus uh, founded, established the sacrament uh, at the River Jordan. Next up is Karen. She's in Albuquerque, New Mexico, also listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Karen, you are on with Father John Tregilio. Hello, Father John. Um, I was calling to get your um, thoughts on, well, I'm not actually looking for your thoughts. I'm looking for, like, some factual thing about these organic practices that rise up within the church. Um, for example, holding hands during the Our Father. Um, more specifically, the one I'm wondering about is this relatively new practice of leaving adoration walking backwards. Um, down the aisle, and um, it it is a pet peeve of mine, and and I'm trying to wrap my brain around um, that. I can't find any rubric for it. I can find rubrics about genuflecting and, and all of that, but not about that. And so, if there is no rubric for it, can we do what we want? Should we do what's normal? Um, what what do you know about that? Okay, well that's that's a good can of worms you opened up and uh um i appreciate your question i also want to know is bugs bunny right you know did he make a wrong turn in albuquerque um you just couldn't help anyway. yourself could you <laughs> no i couldn't um first of all the rubrics of the mass are very precise so the, the gestures the postures genuflecting kneeling uh, beating our breasts making the sign of cross these are specifically spelled out because divine worship uh, especially the Holy Mass, is considered one of the seven sacraments, and the Church has the right and obligation to impose proper regulations on that. Holding hands during the Our Father at Mass is not permitted, but the problem is it crept in, and I just, you know, uh, we, we, we try we try to point out to people that that's not the proper gesture, uh, nor is the, the Oron's position for the people in the pew. That's reserved to the to the priest when he's saying the prayers. But what you do privately, what you do at home, what you do outside the Mass is left at your discretion. Uh, when you're making a, a, a public visit and adoration, uh, that's not considered liturgy in the strict sense. So if someone's going to do something, an extra act of piety, uh, if they're going to back out, you know, they can do that. It's just a little, you know, unusual. It's not required, it's not even suggested, but if someone does that, it's not the same as if they did it at Mass. If you backed out of Mass uh, that way, you, you're not following the, the, the rubrics. Um, genuflecting uh, before the Blessed Sacrament, um, when I was growing up, it was mandatory that you genuflect on both knees when the Blessed Sacrament was in the monstrance. Uh, the current rubrics uh, make it that uh, it's no longer uh, mandatory or necessary. One can genuflect singly, but it doesn't outlaw uh, the double genuflection either. So some of these things, like you mentioned, have crept in. They're, you know, uh, grassroots, I don't know. But where we have to draw the line is when it's strict liturgy, like at Mass, uh, we must follow those rubrics precisely. What people do in their own personal piety. I've seen people who actually lay on the floor uh, when they're at adoration. Um, that's not prescribed. It's not suggested. It's not a sin if somebody does it, but neither should one want to draw attention to themselves rather than drawing attention to Jesus in the real presence. And I think the, the motivation behind that in most cases is to is that they would not want to uh, turn their back on the exposed. Yeah, it's almost the same thing that people would do uh, when Queen Elizabeth was, was alive. They would back out. And then they even changed that, I understand, in England, that it was no longer required. Some people still back down. It was a sign of, of deference and respect for, the, for the, uh, the supreme monarchy of Christ, and I understand that. But it was never mentioned in any books about uh, you know, liturgical or uh, spiritual things uh, to do that. But, yeah, the motivation, I mean, even like holding hands, the motivation might be good, but at Mass it's not supposed to be done. Yeah, you know it's it's uh, I I have found myself in Karen's shoes uh, on many <laughs> on many occasions. And uh, one piece of advice, Karen, I don't know if you'll find it comforting to you or, or, or helpful to you or not, but um, uh, Mother Miriam of the Lamb of God, the former Rosalind Moss, once gave me a piece of advice that when she said, "When I find myself in those sorts of situations, I take a deep breath and I think to myself, Jesus is truly 
and substantially present in the most blessed sacrament, and I am not worthy to receive him. And she said if she focused on that, then the rest of it seemed uh, inconsequential to her at that moment, and hopefully uh, it has certainly helped ease some of my angst, uh, <laughs> and uh, hopefully it'll help you as well, Karen. Thanks so much for the phone call. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Joe is in the great state of Oklahoma, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. You're number one on Sirius today, Father. Joe, you're on with Father John Tregilio. Hi, guys. How are you? Fine. I have a couple questions. Uh, my first one is um, if someone is on their deathbed and they – confess, receive absolution, will they go to heaven if they die immediately after? And the second question is, once that person dies, when does the soul leave the body? Okay, very good questions. Uh, one, uh, as part of the ritual in the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, there is the apostolic pardon that the priest can give. And if the person uh, is properly disposed, obviously they went to confession uh, they went to communion, but they have to also be free of all attachment, even the venial sin. That's not easy to objectify to the point where I can say as the priest that definitely that took place. That's something only God and the person's conscience knows. If that takes place, though, so because it's a plenary indulgence, then yes, that person can theoretically go straight to heaven. Problem is that a lot of us still have some attachment to our venial sins, meaning we still have some pleasant memories or we still, you know, uh, think of with with affection or uh, fondness some of the things we've done before. We know we know it's wrong, but we still have you know some attachment to it. Then it defaults to a partial indulgence, and the person does not automatically uh, go to heaven. They 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 may need to do some purgatory, but it's theoretically possible. That's why it's good to have a priest come, anoint the person, hear their confession, give them viaticum, and then give the apostolic pardon. Um, death takes place when the soul leaves the body. And that's what constitutes death from a metaphysical, spiritual sense. In terms of medicine, they keep changing it. You know, as, as a person flatlining, their EEG showing no brainwave activity. In former days, it was there was no heartbeat. They had a flat uh, EKG. Uh, before that, was the person stopped breathing. Uh, medicine can change when it defines death, but from a ontological, metaphysical uh, definition, death takes place when the soul leaves the body. And then, therefore, that's when the body is no longer a person. That's why uh, a priest cannot anoint someone he is morally certain is dead. He can bless the body. But if he has any doubt, he can conditionally anoint them, of course. Be sure to join us for Take Two with Jerry and Debbie tomorrow at noon Eastern time. Jerry and Debbie want to know about the creative ways you've hidden your Christmas gifts from your loved ones. <laughs> so that's yeah, Take Two with Jerry and Debbie tomorrow. We will have jam phone lines for that show, I'll tell you that. Oh, right? I bet you're going to call in too. I'm going to take notes. I'm going to be listening and taking notes is what I'm going to be doing. Uh, that's uh, Take Two with Jerry and Debbie tomorrow at noon Eastern right here on EWTN Radio. Mark is a first-time caller in Nashville, Tennessee, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Mark, you're on with Father Tregilio. Hey, Father. Thank you for taking my call. Um, you had a statement a few minutes ago about the sin of mutilating yourself and becoming um, either vasectomy or the tubal ligation. If you have had that procedure, do you now need to avoid um, intimacy with your spouse? No. No, once the sin has taken place and you go to confession, that's all that needs to be done. You do not have to get the, the procedure reversed. You could if you wanted to, but there's no obligation. You abstain from any relations with your husband or wife um, because the, the sin has been absolved. So, yeah, you're, you're not in a perpetual state of making recompense for that. Thanks, Mark. That's a great question. We appreciate it today. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Dennis is another first-time caller in the great Commonwealth of Kentucky listening on Savior Radio. Dennis, you're on with Father John. Uh, hello, Father. Hi. Uh, will you please explain in a very simple way uh, modernism and is modernism the same or similar to secularism? And I will hang up and listen to your answer. Okay, yes, it's very similar because the 
the heresy of modernism is that uh, the modern age era is better than everything came before it, that uh, any advances in science or psychology um, out, uh, outrank everything else metaphysically, philosophically, theologically. Um, popes have condemned modernism. It used to be an oath against modernism that priests uh, and deacons and bishops used to have to take. Um, but basically it, it is a form of secularism where the, ma the material world, the secular world, uh, is seen as having more w value and having more truth than uh, the, the philosophical or especially even the theological. And it's the o opposite because theologically everything that's been revealed to us by God is infallibly true. Um, what we know by reason is, is, is true. Um, the scientific world, you know, uh, is always growing and advancing because it's based on empirical uh, evidence, uh, observation, experimentation, and there's always more information that can be gathered. But uh, in terms of theologically, you know, Jesus is true God and true man. Uh, modernism seeks to put its, its value on man-made structures, politically or otherwise, and it sees the church as a hindrance, and that's why it's, it's condemned. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Just a couple minutes left, so I'm going to ask Vanessa's question for you. She is in the great state of Nebraska listening on the Amazon Echo. And with regard to female altar servers, her daughter is very excited, and she wants to know if she should promote it and let her be a server. Well, if it's allowed by the diocese and the, and the parish, it's allowed. It's an option. Uh, just like if, if the option is allowed for communion in the hand or confession face to face. I mean, your option is your option. That being said, you know, you can also as a parent say, no, I, 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 I prefer you not. You have the right as a parent. But if a thing is allowed, um, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that. But it's uh, on the opposite, too. If a priest or a bishop says, no, we're not going to have altar girls uh, or we're only going to have confession uh, anonymously, then that's their legitimate right to make that decision. And really quickly, Father, Joanna writes in and she says, thank you so much for teaching on the Catholic faith. I appreciate it so much. A friend sent me something on the divine will by Louisa Picaretta recently, and as far as I know, she's not approved by the church. Some years ago, a friend of mine had great devotion to St. Louis de Montfort and true devotion to Mary, but was introduced to the divine will and then abandoned de Montfort. I'm very skeptical about the divine will since it's not approved by the church. Do you know anything else about this? I know that there's a lot more uh, issues of concern and suspicions, and I say go with what's already been tested, tried and true. St. Louis de uh, you know, I'm uh, the, the chaplain here for the Legion of Mary here at the seminary. Louis de Montfort, we're going to make a consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary based on his formula uh, on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Divine will, it's not been outwardly condemned, but it's not been endorsed. So go with the stuff you already know with. Father, would you leave us with a blessing? Benedica vos omnipotens Deus, Pater, et Filius, et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen. Amen. On behalf of our host, Father John Tregilio, our celebrity producer, Mr. Charles Beery, our call screener, Mr. Matt Gubensky, and social media maven, Mr. Jeff Burson. I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line Monday. Just getting started on this second week of Advent. Tomorrow, Father Wade Menezes talks faith, family, and fellowship. Father Mitch is in on Wednesday. We'll talk to our Dominican Father Brian Milady on Thursday and wrap things up on Friday with our very own Vice President of Theology, Mr. Colin Donovan. Until we get together tomorrow with Father Wade, God bless. <laughs>